Happy Easter. It's a wonderful Easter morning, isn't it? Even though we can't be together, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could? We're going to say that phrase, Christ is risen, and you know the response. So I want to hear you out. I want to hear you shout it out wherever you may be. Um, I'm going to say Christ is risen, and then you say, Christ is risen indeed. You ready? Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We'll try it again one more time. Boys and girls, are you there? Can you give this a go? Belt it out. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Wow, that sounds fantastic. From wherever you're watching, you are very welcome. Boys and girls, you are especially welcome. And it's great. We've got Bethany's coming to speak to you in a little while. Isn't that wonderful? I'm very excited about that. But to our own congregation, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could be together? I'm really sorry we're not. I'd love to be giving you a hug and a kiss and wishing you a happy Easter. Uh, we also didn't have our, our sunrise service um, this morning, although we, uh, Dawn, Bethany and Deborah and I went down to the beach for sunrise. It was a bit cloudy, but it was very beautiful. We saw Michael and Kathy there. And then when I got home, I got a phone call. And uh, when I lift up, lifted up the phone, uh, what I could hear in my ear was, uh, from the Messiah, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I thought, who is this beautiful person singing on the phone? And uh, it was Audrey Glover. She wasn't singing, but she was letting me hear. So Audrey and Adrian and everybody, happy Easter to you. Um, I thought we would uh, read Isaiah 61 um, to begin with. Isaiah 61, which is the passage that Jesus used at the very beginning of his ministry to announce who he was and why he had come. Listen to these wonderful words. First three verses. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoner, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Not a beautiful passage, that is why he came. We'll be thinking about that today, why he had come. But those beautiful pictures, he had come for you and for me. We're gonna sing two songs, but before we do, I think we'll pray and then, in fact, no, we'll sing two songs and then we'll pray and then Bethany will come and speak to us. Shall we do that? First one is a great one, one of my favourites. See what a morning, gloriously bright. Now earlier on it was not gloriously bright, but it was lovely. Here at the moment it's drizzling rain, but that's fine, it's beautiful. And then we're going to sing, um, Oh praise the name of the Lord our God. Uh, some of us may not know this very well, but it's a lovely one. Oh praise the name of the Lord our God. So let us, let us worship God. The word should be on your um, Facebook feed or whatever it is, hopefully you've always got it up. And uh, so let's worship God with this great song. Christ is risen. See 
Father, we celebrate with you, with the angels. We celebrate, Lord, that Jesus has risen from the dead, that Christ has been raised, the one promised from the beginning, the one who came, the one who breathed our air and walked on our roads, who ate our food, who felt as we feel and yet without sin, the one who went to a cross willingly. Father, we thank you that he did. What a gift. And Lord, we thank you that in his death, he defeated sin and death and hell. And in his resurrection, we have victory in the name of Jesus. So Lord Jesus, we, all of us, wherever we're listening, boys and girls, young and old, rich and poor, Father, together we say, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Lord, put this celebratory note in everything we do over this next short time. Put this celebratory note deep in our hearts, Lord. Let it not be words alone, but let it be a conviction of our hearts. So, Lord Jesus, we want to lift you high. We want to hear your voice. We want to celebrate your awesome victory. And we do pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, boys and girls and everybody, Bethany's coming to speak to us. Isn't that great? Good morning and happy Easter. I want to start by asking you, have you ever had a surprise? Maybe it was a surprise birthday party. Maybe it was a present that someone bought you that you weren't expecting to get. Maybe the surprise came in the form of a shock or a scare. Maybe someone jumped out from behind something and shouted boo and surprised you. Well, the people in this story today they had quite a few surprises. So this story started early one morning, very early. And as Dad said to you earlier, we were down on the beach this morning to watch the sunrise. And these people would have been getting up just around that same time. And it was three women and they were on their way to Jesus's tomb to see his body. And on their way there, they noticed that the stone had rolled away. The stone was away from the entrance of the tomb and they could not see a body. Jesus' body had gone. It wasn't there. Now can you imagine what that would have been like as you're going up to this tomb? This stone was so heavy that not even the strongest man in the world could have moved this stone. But it had moved. Would you have wanted to be the first one to go in or would you have been knocking the others going, no, you go in first, I'm not going. Because I don't think I would have gone in first. But they headed up to the tomb and not only was it a scary tomb that had no body in it and a stone that had rolled away but sitting where Jesus's body had laid was what do you know it was an angel and an angel said to the woman don't be scared don't be scared it's an angel I would be petrified if I was them. This angel is just sitting where Jesus had laid Jesus's body and says, don't be scared. And he says to the ladies, why are you here? A tomb is for dead people, but Jesus is alive. Um, no, he's not. We watched him die on the cross two days ago. How is Jesus alive? So two of the ladies left, but one stayed around the garden, crying as she would, because she has lost Jesus' body. Her best friend, his body is missing. But there's someone else in the garden with her, maybe a gardener. And he says, why are you crying? And she says, Jesus' body has gone. I can't find him. And then he says, Mary. <gasps> no one else says my name like he does. And she looked at him and she fell at his feet and said, Jesus. And she grabbed on his feet and I'm sure you would just not want to let go, would you? Here he is, alive like the angel had said. 
And he said, Mary, I want you to go back and tell the others that I am alive. So what do you do when you get good news? Do you keep it in and think, I'll tell someone later whenever I remember about it? No, you want to tell everybody, don't you? So Mary runs as fast as she can, as quickly as she can, and she does not stop running until she reaches the city where all the others are. And she says, Jesus is alive. He is alive. He said that he would die. And on the third day, he would raise again and he would be alive. And he is. And I saw him and I hugged him. And he called me by my name. And I'm sure that was a surprise for the others as well. And we weren't there on that day. We weren't at the tomb. We didn't have the shock of our life when we saw an angel sitting there instead of Jesus. But we can do that last part. We get to run as fast as we can. We get to tell everybody that Jesus is alive. We get to shout that. And so if you're talking to people, you maybe see them today, maybe talk to them on the phone, you tell them Jesus is alive. And that is what we are celebrating today. And we've got a song to match that. So it's called One, Two, Three, Jesus is Alive. And Deb's now going to do some actions. So if you're at home, please join in. We'll play the song. You'll hear the song. You can follow along in our actions. They're not difficult and you don't need to stand up and dance about. So if you're sitting down and you want to do them, please join in. But kids, if you're there and you want to dance about, now's your time. Dance about to a song. So Deb's now going to join in. You never know, our dog might even join in as well. You might get an appearance from her. But we get you to join in with us in this song.
Fabulous. Wasn't yours were you doing that? Everybody, were you doing that? One, two, three, Jesus is alive. And you can keep doing that all day. You'll find that on YouTube. And get those actions. I love that. Jesus is our friend. I like that high five. Boys and girls, don't we always do that in church? Give me five. And you do it really hard because you really mean it, which is really, really great. So we're going to have a reading. And the reading is from uh, Luke chapter 24. So if anybody wants to get a, a Bible um, and have a look at it, it's going to be Luke chapter 24. And Dawn is going to come and read it for us. I'm still feeling a little bit emotional about um, when Bethany made, made Mary come to life and just her reaction to seeing Jesus. <laughs> Wonderful. So we're going to read that story, read the account of, uh, of the resurrection in Luke chapter 24, uh, starting in verse 1. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly... Two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. Then they came back from the tomb. They told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. And bending over, he saw the strips of linen lying by themselves. And he went away, wondering to himself what had happened. Right. We're going to sing again before we think about this passage, this lovely passage. And we're going to sing one that we all know really well, In Christ Alone, My Hope is Found. Then the beautiful last verse, No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. This is the resurrection power in us. This is what we celebrate today. We don't need to be frightened. We don't need to feel guilty because of what Jesus has done, because of the victory that he has achieved. So shall we sing this, um, this, lovely, this lovely hymn, In Christ Alone, My Hope is Found. <laughs> Yeah. 
beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. So, we want to think about this wonderful, wonderful Easter story. It's a story that many of us are very familiar with, of course, isn't it? We, those of us who come through Holy Week, we know, we know the journey. We know some of the things that Jesus did, many of the things that Jesus said. Um, how he went to that cross, how he was beaten, how he was stripped naked, how they spat upon him, how they mocked him, they put that crown of thorns on his head. He was badly beaten, he was badly bruised, he was badly wounded even before they nailed him to the cross. And between the hours of noon and three o'clock in the afternoon, the sun stopped shining. Jesus dies. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And on Friday night we had that beautiful tenebrae service um, with some wonderful people helping to bring it, the story alive as we walk through that journey to the cross. And now we arrive today and the story that Bethany has told us about the women going to the tomb, the, the, the disciples going to the tomb, the angels being there, but one person was not there and that was Jesus because he had risen from the dead. Christ is risen. Can you get that? It is an amazing truth. But it was a truth that was promised a long time before. If you go right back in your Bibles, right to the very beginning, back in Genesis chapter 3, we hear, we hear God saying this to the devil who had, who had, in a sense, begun it all with Adam and Eve. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will bruise his heel. This was Jesus, the offspring of the woman. Jesus who would come all those generations later. The promise was made at the very beginning because a relationship had been damaged, because sin is anything that breaks that relationship with God. And that relationship had been broken, but he had a plan to restore it. And Jesus was the plan. Jesus was the way to God. Jesus was the redeemer to buy us back. Jesus was the healer to fix us. Jesus was the one to pick us up. This was our Jesus. The very first glimpse of this promise of God back in Genesis. And if you've got time later on, go back to the very end of the Bible, to Revelation chapter 20, and you see the final demise of Satan when he's thrown into that lake of sulfur. But this is God's plan, and Jesus is right at the heart of it. But I want to ask you a question. Is the resurrection important? Is the resurrection important for our faith as Christians? Do we need the resurrection? What do you think the answer is? This is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If Christ has not been raised, then our, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Paul's talking about the bodily resurrection of Jesus. Sometimes you hear people saying, Jesus rose spiritually. But that's not what Paul says. That's not what the disciples saw. That's not what the ladies saw. That's not what many people saw. The evidence is overwhelming. We're not here to look at that evidence today, but it's overwhelming if you want to have a look. Hundreds of people saw Jesus. They talked to him. They touched him. They ate with him. Wow. He said, I'm not a ghost. I've got flesh and blood and bones. Look at me. No, Jesus had risen from the dead. But the second question we want to look at, and this is the most important one for us, what has this got to do with me? Jesus rose from the dead. So, does it make any difference to my faith? What does it mean to me that Jesus came to earth, took on our flesh, died our death, and rose again from the dead. What has that got to do with me? Was this simply Jesus showing how amazing he is? Was he showing off, look, I can die and I can come back to life again. Is that it? Is that what it was all about? No. Listen again to some of the words that I read at the beginning from Isaiah 61. Because these are the words that were written by Isaiah 
more than 700 years before Jesus was born, and the words that Jesus used to start his ministry, and the words that we're thinking about today. Listen to what, he, what Jesus said, what Jesus used from years before. The Spirit of the Lord God is on me, he said. He has anointed me what to do. Has he anointed me to go to the earth and show people how wonderful I am? No, he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to what? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captive and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, to comfort all who mourn. This is why he'd come. To give them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. The oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise. But maybe what about a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair? That is why he came. Here's some other words Jesus said when he was on the earth. I have come to seek and save that which was lost. I have come into the world as light. Why? So that he who believes in me should not remain in darkness. Here's another thing he said. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The final little bit I'm going to give you is where Jesus said, I have come that you may have life. And have it in abundance. It's not mind blowing. He came for you. He died, was resurrected for you. It was for our benefit. If it wasn't for us, he wouldn't have come. No need to come, but he did it for you. And the wonderful thing is that all the billions of people who live in the world today and the millions who have lived in the past and maybe the millions who live in the future. But if you had been the only person on the face of the earth ever, he would have come for you. Maybe today you're feeling alone or lonely. Maybe you feel you don't have a friend in the world. But you do. He would have come for you to bind up the brokenhearted, to give us a spirit of praise instead of a spirit of despair, the oil of gladness instead of mourning for you. You know, it's very easy to be an observer in life, isn't it? Sometimes there are things we'd love to do and we never get round to doing them. And we might have great talents that we could use in a particular way, but we never use them in that way. Life just goes past. And are we really good at watching TV? I know I am. I'm really good at watching TV and watching lots of people bake cakes rather than bake one. Or watch lots of people make a beautiful meal instead of making one. Or to see people playing rugby instead of playing it. Or climbing the mountain instead of climbing it. We're very good at being observers. But in our faith we can't be observers. We have to be participants. That's what it means to be a Christian. Sometimes that we can even come to church and as though we are observers or worse, critics, when we should be participants because we're all in this together. And it is as we participate, that's what Jesus meant, that's what the word means in the Old Testament that says you've got to love the Lord your God. Why? How? By observing him? By saying, yeah. No, you've got to love him with all your heart and soul and mind and strength with everything you are this is not this is not this is something to participate in love the lord your god with everything you are jesus loved his father with everything he was and even in that uh, time of ministry of his years of ministry there was that wonderful occasion maybe twice when he went into the temple and he got rid of all the money changers and when everyone went in, the disciples thought, what is going on here? And then they remembered words from a psalm, a psalm of David that says, his disciples remember that it is written, zeal for your house will consume me. Jesus was consumed for this temple where God presenced himself and it was for all these people to pray. 
and people were using it for some other reason. He was consumed with passion. And that's why he came to the earth, because he was consumed for love for us. God loved the world so much that he sent his one and only son. So you can't be an observer. You've got to be a participant. And participation means we do it together. Now, anyone who's a member of our church knows that my favourite word is the word together. I think it's a lovely word, isn't it? We worship together. That's what we're doing, even though we're apart. We pray together. We learn together. We serve together. We laugh together. We cry together. This is what it means to be a church. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We're called into a community. God himself is a community, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he wants us to join this community of his body. That's what we do. You can't be an observer from a distance. You've got to come in and love him with everything that you are. You know, it's good to do things together. I was thinking about this and thinking, if someone were to offer me a holiday, you know, we were meant to be on holiday a couple of weeks ago. It didn't happen. Flights were cancelled. But if, if the travel agent were to come to me today and say, look, I've got a ticket. You can go anywhere in the world. All expenses paid. First class accommodation. First class flights. Everything would be the best of the best of the best. You can go everywhere and anywhere. So the only thing is, I've only got one ticket. You've got to go on your own. What would you do? I know what I would do. I would say, wow. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. I would say, no thanks. It's not for me. And it wouldn't be for me. I wouldn't go. It wouldn't, it wouldn't tempt me in the slightest. For if you cannot share those kind of experiences with the people you love, they're empty. They mean nothing. Absolutely nothing. There could be a beautiful place, but if you see it alone or a lovely sunrise, you see it on your own, you just want to say to someone, isn't this fabulous? And for them to say, yeah, it is. That's really living. That is participating. And that's what our faith is all about. It's about sharing the experience, the highs and the lows. Jesus feels like that. Jesus is a king. A king has a kingdom. Now, what kind of kingdom would it be if there was nobody in that kingdom? You're a king of nothing, king of nobody. Jesus doesn't want to be a king of nobody. He wants to share the experience. He wants to share his kingdom with you and with me. That's why he came. It was all for me. And the resurrection makes that possible. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He is the first fruits, which means what? Well, you expect to be a whole harvest of fruits. He's the first, but he's not the only. He's the first fruits. And we who believe are the, are the others. That's what he's talking about. Jesus is the first fruits of a great big harvest. His resurrection guarantees our resurrection if we believe in Jesus. It is guaranteed. He is the first fruits, and we enjoy that. Remember the other day I talked about how the disciples at one point after the transfiguration, and Jesus said, I don't want you to tell anybody about what you've seen until after the Son of Man has uh, been raised from the dead. And as they were walking back home, they were discussing among themselves, what is he talking about? What does raised from the dead mean? What does raised from the dead mean? Well, I bet whenever they got to that tomb and it was empty, they... It was greater, more fantastic, more overwhelming than they could imagine. What does raised from the dead mean? It means that you are raised from the dead. Dead, alive. Get it, disciples? Get it? Uh, I think so. But, that, but that's what it was all about. Because Jesus had risen, they could be raised to life too. And it's the same for us. But the resurrection isn't only for the life to come. It is for the life today. And when Jesus said, I have come that you may have life in all its fullness. All this is possible because Jesus has risen and he's ascended. He made us. He knows us. He wants what is very best for us. He loves us with depth 
and of purity. He has got zeal for us. He's consumed by love for us. And that is for today. To live this kind of life, life in all its fullness with Jesus, means we cannot be onlookers. We cannot be standbyers. We have to be in the thick of it. Participants. So how do you feel? Do you feel you are an observer or a participant? Sometimes I look at my life and I still feel like I'm an observer. Sometimes I am. Sometimes I'm at the very heart of it and it's so good. And sometimes I just love to let go and let God do whatever he wants. Maybe you feel the same as that. Let's not be frightened to let God have his way. When he says, don't worry about tomorrow, but seek first the kingdom, let's trust him. The resurrection is proof that he can be trusted. This great adventure of life. When the disciples got to the tomb, you know, some of them were wondering, how are we ever going to roll away that big stone? It's a heavy stone. But when they got there, the stone, stone had already been moved. Now, why was that? Was the stone moved to let Jesus out? No. Jesus didn't need the stone to be moved to let him out. The stone was moved to let the disciples and anybody who wanted to in see that he was gone. He's not here, as the angel said. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He has risen. And so we look into the empty tomb. And the empty tomb means it's possible to have a full life. He wants us to have life in all its fullness, and it's only possible because of the empty tomb. He fills us with his spirit, and that's how we do it. This is life in the kingdom. This is the treasure in a field. This is the pearl of great price. Remember those wonderful parables? The man who found the pearl, he would give up everything, sell everything in order to have it. This is the kingdom. That's the way God wants you to feel about him and his kingdom. I'd leave everything behind just to have you and to be part of your kingdom. This is the good news of the Easter story. That is why the disciples didn't keep it to themselves. That is why they went out and told many people. And from a handful of believers when Jesus was resurrected to only three centuries later when there were millions of believers. Because they told. Because the news is too good, too good to keep yourself. Do you want to live even though you die? And this is the message that you've got to share. Bethany was saying about sharing this good news. Children can do it, but we're all children. We can learn to do it if we're not very good at it. We can practice to do it. And do you know something? God is with you, always. His Spirit is within you. And it is the Spirit who works through you. Do you want Him to? Will you let Him? This is the wonderful Easter message. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's jump on board this adventure, this journey with Jesus. We're going to pray and Dawn is going to lead us in our prayers. So let's all pray. As we come to pray, let's just take a moment of quiet to reflect on what Gary has been saying to us and just what you are saying to us through it, what the, what Lord, the Lord is saying to us through it. Um, and then we'll come and pray to him who has the power to raise Christ from the dead. So let's just pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you on this Easter morning to worship you and to seek your blessing. 
As we stood on the beach this morning, looking for the sun to rise, we saw only colour on the horizon, but the clouds hid the glory of the rising sun. And in the midst of our current world situation, we can feel like the light is hidden behind the clouds of fear and uncertainty, of sickness, death and mourning, and worry about jobs and businesses and family overseas, to name but a few. We can feel like the friends and family of Jesus must have done on Good Friday. Their world had been shaken. Their expectations for the future had been shattered and life had changed irrevo irrevocably. But as we come to pray for our world in the grip of this pandemic, we pray for wisdom for our leaders, for scientists and doctors as they look to find the best way to combat the spread and the effects of this disease. We pray for safety for doctors, nurses, porters, cleaners, OTs, physios, all those involved in our healthcare system who expose themselves to danger every day they work. Please let there be enough protective equipment to keep them safe and give them the strength and the stamina to keep going in their busy, busy shifts. We pray for those who are ill at the moment in hospital or at home. We pray for healing and for hope. We pray for the families who mourn, who can't even have the comfort of close family and friends and who may feel very alone and isolated. Be their comfort and their peace, Lord. We pray for families who have had to take on the role of educators as well as parents, who have no respite from the incessant chatter and energy of young children. Give them joy in this time. Let them create memories for the future and be thankful for the gift of the internet. Our present experience makes us more mindful of our brothers and sisters across the globe, for whom meeting together as a church family always comes with the risk of death or imprisonment for to worship in your own home is commonplace and separation from family and friends for long periods is a reality. We pray that they will know every day the reality of your presence, Jesus, our living Lord, and may they be strengthened and encouraged to keep running the race. For us all, Lord, wherever we are and whatever our circumstances, we give thanks to you for your faithfulness and your care. And as we look to the future, let the darkness pass and the hope of new things become reality, just as they did on that first Easter morning. Amen. So our service is almost complete. We're going to sing one last piece. We're going to sing, what would you like to sing? Oh, I think we'll sing, um, what about Thine Be the Glory? I think that would be a wonderful one to finish on, wouldn't it? So let's all stand, if you want to. Um, and just sing this one with gusto. Thine be the glory, risen, conquering sun, conquering sun, endless is the victory. Thou or death has won. <clears throat>
by praying. Hope you have a wonderful, wonderful Easter day. We will meet again tomorrow at noon for our noon time reflection. Um, Christ is risen. Let's join together to pray. Let us all pray. So may the Spirit of the Lord, the Sovereign Lord, be upon us. May we live as those released from captivity and darkness. May we know beauty instead of ashes, praise instead of despair. And may we, in the strength of your power, be those who display your splendor. Amen. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Until tomorrow.